to everyone either on the 30th or 31st. We'll start on the 1st and we'll read through the entire Bible in a year. How many of you would love to read the entire Bible in one year? How cool would that be? And, uh, and get the word in you. Okay, so four of you want that. Well, praise God. Amen. Well, for the four of you, we're going to have a good time. Amen. <laughs> uh, but uh, if you'll do that, that will be awesome. I, I've got a word from you today, for, from God, for you today, and it's called the light of Christmas. Everybody say the light of Christmas. Light of Christmas. Let's go to Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7. I know if you've been in church very long, you know this is the Christmas story. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 7, and it's on, on the screens behind me, but if you've got your Bibles, you can turn there. Now, in those days, a decree went out from Caesar Augustus. Now, if you're new to church... You're not familiar with church. Caesar Augustus was a guy from history by the name of Octavian. His great uncle was Julius Caesar. So Julius Caesar actually has family in the Bible, believe it or not. That, that stuff's real. That, those, those are not fictitious people. That's real history. And uh, that a census be taken of all the inhabited earth. This was the first census taken while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone was on his way to register for the census, each to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, from the city of Nazareth to Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and family of David, in order to register along with Mary, who he was engaged to, who was engaged to him, and was with child. While they were there, the days were completed for her to give birth. And she gave birth to her firstborn son, and she wrapped him in clothes, laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the end. Revelation twenty two sixteen 16 says, I, Jesus, have sent my angel to give you this testimony for the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David, the bright morning star. Jesus is the light of Christmas. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for your presence. Thank you for your word. I pray you speak to us now. God, anoint me, not one word of my, of my own, but every word straight from the throne of God into our hearts. Lord, let this seed be planted in the good soil of our heart and grow bear forth fruit in our lives. In Christ's name. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. We have a little tradition we do here. If you'll hold your Bibles up in whatever form, if it's a phone, if it's a paper Bible, however, and let's boldly declare, Father, Father today, today, this week, this week by, your grace, by your grace, I'm going to be a doer of your word and not a hearer only, a hearer. deceiving my own self. Deceiving now, Lord, anoint my ears. Lord, anoint my heart. Anoint my spirit, my soul, and my mind, and my body to receive the truth of your word. In Christ's name I pray. Amen. High five somebody and say, he's the light of Christmas. <laughs> yes. You may be seated. Thank you. So your standard man generally at this point in the Christmas season has not yet bought any Christmas gifts. He has bought a grand total of zero by this point. As a matter of fact, the standard man has not gotten around to buying a Christmas gift that his wife really appreciates from last year yet. He could tell by her reaction last year that she wasn't exactly dreaming of that automobile emergency kit he gave her. Even though it was the deluxe model with booster cables and an air compressor. He understands that she's, he's broken some type of rule. But at this point in time, he still has no idea what that earthly is. Because he's a man. Women give it up. Yeah, that's right. We're men, right? Two young boys were spending the night at their grandparents' house the week before Christmas. They were excited about Christmas. They wanted some presents. So the older brother said, well, why don't we pray? Well, ask God for some. They got down on their, hand, their knees on the side of the bed, and the younger brother began to pray, only he was shouting his prayers. Dear God, I want a new bicycle. Dear God, give me a new Nintendo system. The older brother said, man, what is wrong with you? He slapped him. He said, God ain't deaf. He said, no, but Grandma is. <laughs> the longest night of the year is December 21st going into December 22nd. It's true. It's called the winter solstice, if you're familiar with that at all. It's the shortest time between the sun rising and the sun setting, i.e., 
The 21st, 22nd is the shortest day of the year and the longest night of the year. Christmas was set around this time of year, around the winter solstice, back in the 4th century. The question is why? Why would they do that? In ancient times, people looked to the stars and heavens for important dates. And you would think that the sun is actually furthest from the earth in winter, but it's not. It's the opposite. The sun is actually closest to the earth during this time of year, especially in the northern hemisphere, than it is any other time of year. As a matter of fact, the sun is closest to the earth, usually somewhere around the first week of January. So you have the darkest, longest night of the year. You have the sun being the closest, but yet the darkest kind of time of year, the longest time of year. So why did they do that? Why would they choose back in the third century, and why did we keep the birth of Christ? Because let me just get you a little uh, cliff notes here. Christ probably was not born on December 25th. Uh, he might have been conceived around this time of year. He was most likely born in the fall. But uh, just we celebrate it, and it's good. We have to pick some time. There's a particular reason why they did this, and it's very important in the message that we have today. Why would they pick the darkest, longest, coldest time of year to celebrate the birth of Christ. They chose that because they want you to know that Christmas represents Jesus being the light, and they want us to remember that Jesus is the light of our life during the darkest times of our life. During the longest, darkest time of the year is when they celebrate the light of Christ and the light of God coming to this earth. During the times when you traditionally are in a dark place in your life. During a time when you feel like that, man, all hell has come against you. During a time in your life when you feel like what else could possibly go wrong. During a time in your life when you feel like I am at wit's end, what else could go wrong. And you think God is the furthest from you, actually he's the closest to you. When it's dark and cold on the winter solstice coming up in just a few days... It's going to feel like the sun is furthest, but it's actually the closest. I want to tell you, when you go through your darkest, coldest times in your life, you can rest assured Christ is the closest if you'll just call out to him. Amen. During your darkest times, he is there. You can count on it 100% of the time. During the darkest, coldest times, he is there. When you go through the death of a loved one, God is there. When the boss gives you a pink slip or you don't know how you're going to pay your bills, Christ is with you. If you're going through a devastating divorce, Christ is with you. No matter what your trial is, no matter how brutal the breakup with a friendship is, Christ is with you. No matter if you're crushed by a family member or a friend's betrayal, I want to tell you Christ is there. No matter how dark and bleak this life gets, Christ is there. That is why they picked, I believe that's why God allowed Christmas to be picked this time of year to let us know no matter how dark it gets, Christ is there. If the bank forecloses on the house or repossesses the car, I want to tell you, Christ is there. When the doctor gives you a bad doctor's report that you don't want to hear, Christ is there. Man, does anybody know what I'm talking about here today? Amen. He's the light of Christmas. He's the light of the world. He's there to tell us, I am there for you. There are several attributes to light that I want to hit in just three points today. Point number one is this. Light attracts attention. Everybody say that with me. Light attracts attention. I mean, our eyes are immediately drawn to light, right? When you go into a dark room, if there is a night light or a little candle, it doesn't have to be bright. Any kind of light source, what happens? Your eyes are immediately what? Attracted to that light. You are immediately notice it. It immediately comes to the forefront, and I believe that's why Christ came at the coldest, darkest time of the year, to draw attention to the fact that he has come to die for you and I. When you're outside at night and a bolt of lightning comes across the sky, maybe you're driving and all of a sudden you see a bolt of lightning, what happens? If you're in my car, my wife usually goes, oh, and scares me, I think I'm running off the road or something, and we got to get the wheel, control of the wheel. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. 
Or if you're from South Georgia or from the Georgia area, we have lightning bugs. I think they call them June bugs here, but we call them lightning bugs. And when you're outside and it's dark and it's summer and it's humid and you see lightning bugs going everywhere, the light attracts attention. It reminds me of the movie Bugs Life. You put a bug zapper out and the bugs go into it and the other bugs going, don't do it, Harry, don't do it. And the little bug dies. <laughs> Isaiah 9, 2, if you're not used to me, I'm a little whack sometimes. <laughs> The people who walked in darkness have seen a what? A great light. Those who dwelt in the land of the shadow of death, upon them what? A light has shined. This was prophetic. This was Isaiah and a prophetic word of how Messiah Jesus was going to come and be a light to the world. He was going to shine up our light. He was going to be a light in a dark place for us. I want to tell you, I, there was times that I've been in a dark place. You name it, done it. Most of you know my testimony. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. I want to tell you. But when Jesus came into my light, he illuminated things, and I saw things differently than I'd ever seen before. In other words, Isaiah was saying, people were going to be attracted to his light. I want to tell you there is something attractive about the light of Jesus Christ in our lives. I'm going to know what I'm talking about. Yes. Considering the timing and the conditions surrounding Jesus' birth, it attracted a lot more attention than people would have thought. Now, just think about this for a second. This is no pun against someone that's poor, but poor people, when they have a baby, nobody really cares, right? It's not like Prince William and Kate having their third child or Prince Harry and Meghan Markle having their second child. The whole world, they're not royalty and these things. Joseph and Mary didn't have any money. They were poor people. Secondly, they had to leave the town they were coming from and go to a town where they basically hardly knew anybody. So when the baby's born, what do we do when our, when our family members have a baby? What do we do? Nowadays, we get on social media. We tell everybody there's a new baby born. We show pictures, the whole kit and caboodle. How many know what I'm talking about? Well, back then, they're there in Bethlehem. They don't have no family, no friends to, to, to brag. Hey, no, let me tell my neighbors. Let me tell my friends. So not only are they poor nobody's really paying attention to poor people that have babies especially back then they go to Bethlehem which is a little insignificant nothing town as a matter of fact they weren't even in the town they were on the outskirts of town with animals and a barn he was also born at night when everybody else was sleeping he was born 1,400 years before the printing press, 1,900 years before the internet, television, and radio. You would think if any baby's going to be born under those circumstances, it would not attract a thing. However, God brought forth the divine light and saw to it that Jesus' birth, against all odds, attracted the attention of many. Take a look at Luke chapter 2 verse 8 through 16. In the same region there were some shepherds staying out in the fields and keeping watch over the flock by night. And the angel of the Lord suddenly stood before them and the glory of the Lord shone round about them and they were terribly frightened. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid for behold I bring you good news of great joy which will be for all the people. For today in the city of David there had been born for you a Savior who is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in clothes, lying in a manger. And suddenly there appeared with the angel of the multitude of the heavenly host, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among men with whom he is pleased. When the angels had gone away from them into heaven, the shepherds began saying to one another, Let us go straight to Bethlehem then and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. So they came in a hurry and found their way to Mary and Joseph and the baby as he lay in the manger. I love this. Even though the rest of the world, all your normal circumstances would say no one's going to notice this baby, God saw to it that the world was attracted to him. So much so, he put a star in the sky. And Magi, we talked about this the last couple of weeks, eight to 900 miles away, saw the star, saw the attraction of the light, and said, we've got to go find this Savior. I want to tell you, God makes himself known to everybody. 
when he began his ministry as a light in a dark world. Jesus couldn't go anywhere. Everywhere he went, there were so many people he couldn't get in the house. There were so many people he had to get in the boat on a seashore and go out. Everywhere he did, people were tugging at him. People were pulling on him. Everywhere he went, he was attracting people, and he's still doing it today. Somebody say amen. Amen. From the time of his birth till he died, he attracted people's attention, and he's still doing it. Look what John 12, 32 says. And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men to himself. He is that irresistible light of mankind that draws us. He is that irresistible light that just says, man, I see the light. I see something. He is, he is pulling us out of that spiritual darkness. He is the light of life. He's the answer we're looking for. We don't have to fumble around in the dark anymore. We can just go to him and he'll lead us. As a matter of fact, that's point number two, and that is this. Light guides our steps. Everybody say, light guides our steps. You know, just like a lighthouse leads a ship through dangerous waters, so does the light of Jesus guide us in this darkness of this world. How many of you know we're in a dark world? I mean, there's a lot of junk going on. Jesus came to give us direction. John 14, 6 says, He is the way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father but by Him. Remember the Magi were guided by Him. As a matter of fact, Zechariah, his uncle, John the Baptist's dad, prophesied when he heard about him having his own son, prophesied and said this in Luke 1, 79. Check out what it says. To give light. To those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. To guide our feet into the way of peace. Jesus said about himself, John 12, 35. Jesus told them, you are going to have the light just a little while longer. Walk while, walk while you have the light before darkness overtakes you. Whoever walks in the dark does not know where they are going. Now Jesus has given us the Bible. He's given us the Holy Spirit. He is the light of our life and he guides us. We know that. Proverbs 3, 5 through 6 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not into your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will direct your paths. Albert Einstein got on a train. Everyone recognized him. I'm sure you would recognize him too. He's very distinguishable. Sat down on the train. People were looking at him. The conductor's going around punching tickets for people on the train. And he noticed Albert Einstein sitting there just fumbling through all his belongings, fumbling through his papers, fumbling through his satchel, fumbling through his pockets. He came up and he said, Mr. Einstein, what's wrong? Mr. I Albert Einstein said, well, I, I've lost my ticket and I've forgotten my stop. He said, oh, Mr. Einstein, we all know who you are. You're good. He said, I know who I am too. I just don't know where I'm going. <laughs> Isn't it? Isn't that true of some of us? We know who we are, but sometimes we don't know where we're going. Have you ever been blindfolded? Anybody ever blindfolded you and played a game, had fun? You know, the smallest of objects can trip you up. Now, you take the blindfold off and it won't. You know, when I was going through my frat induction, and I can only tell you some of the G-rated stuff, but... One of the things that happened was is they thought it was funny to blindfold me and another guy going through induction, and they gave me a uh, plunger, and I had to get down on one knee with blindfolding, and I had to be Elmer Fudd, and I had to shoot the rabbit who was 10 feet from me, my induction mate, and they made me do the accent and everything. I'd say, silly rabbit, <laughs> bang, bang, you're dead, silly rabbit, you know, and I'm shooting the plunger, and I could hear 10 feet from me and never could see him, you'd hear him go, oh, you got me, and he'd roll on his back, and they'd make his legs and feet quiver up in the air. They thought it was a lot of fun. They were laughing at our expense, having a good time. Have you ever been blindfolded before? I mean, really. You ever tried to walk around in the dark? You ever tried, well, I can, I can find my way. I know one day I was walking. I had to go to the restroom in the middle of the night, and, uh, and, and I didn't know there were some pillows in the floor, and I'm walking, and all of a sudden, you know, poop, and I hit the ground, and I hear, ugh. Well, when I hit the ground, and I'm doing the, uh, Holly just bust out laughing in a deep belly laugh. She thought it was hilarious. She said, that was a good one. Well, then from then on, she tried to put them in the floor on purpose to set me up so I could fall some more. 
It's not fun when you're blindfolded. It's not fun when you go out in the dark and you can't see yourself. Well, I want to tell you what's not more fun than that. And that is to spiritually being the dark. That is spiritually to not be able to know where you're going in this life. And Jesus Christ is that light of life that will lead you, guide you, and direct you. Somebody shout amen. If we're not walking with Jesus, if we're not walking in his light, even the smallest of problems in life can become great obstacles. But I promise you, if you will trust in Jesus Christ with everything you've got, he will guide you. He'll show you where the traps are. He'll show you where the things are to trip you up. And he will guide your steps in life. John 8, 12 says it this way. Jesus again spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He is the only way out of the dark. Amen? Amen. My last point is this. Light reveals reality. Everybody say that. Light reveals reality. In the dark <laughs> are flaws, wrinkles, loss of hair, Weight issues are not as noticeable. That's why many couples like to do candlelight dinners because you can't see the flaws. It all looks good in the dark. Somebody say, man, I better go on. I'm going to get some trouble here. When the house is dark, I told you I'm a mess. I like to keep it real, amen? When the house is dark, you don't see that the walls need painting. You don't see that the carpet's frayed. Everything looks great. But man, when you turn the lights on, you look, you say, oh my gosh, man, we need to paint the walls. We got to fix the carpet. These things become noticeable. Why? The darkness conceals reality. But Jesus was clear that darkness is not our friend. John 3.20 says it this way. For everyone who does evil hates the light and does not come to the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. Have you ever noticed that most crimes are done under the cover of darkness? Right? In fact, Jesus said when they came to arrest him in Matthew 26, 55, he said, really, you're coming to arrest me at night? Like there was a reason for that. Why didn't you come arrest me during the day? Human nature is to try and conceal our sin. If we don't want to be, expo we don't want to be exposed, so we want to try to escape to the darkness. That's why so many people run from God. Because they, the conviction of the Holy Spirit makes them feel bad. As a matter of fact, there may be some in here now that you say, I don't feel good being in here. Maybe it's that the light is exposing what's really going on inside your life. Because the light exposes our sin. And that's the purpose of him coming. Not to make you feel bad, but to say, hey, these things are wrong. It's kind of like if you go to the doctor, you don't want the doctor to lie to you, right? Right? I, although I would like to get a good doctor's report, sometimes I go to the doctor and they say, well, you've got these problems. I don't go, you know what, doc? I really don't want to hear that. I'm going to go, no, 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 I can't hear you, although I would like to do that. Or if I go to the dentist and he says, hey, man, i got to put a crown on, I say, uh, excuse me, I can't hear you. What? 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 I don't want to do that. Why? Because I need a problem. If I don't put a crown on, it's going to create a worse problem. I'm going to have to have a root canal. They're going to have to pull my teeth. There's going to be all kinds of issues. Why is it that we don't run from the mailman, we don't run from the dentist, we don't run from the doctor, but somehow when God starts knocking, we say, whew, I don't want nothing to do with that. We need to receive that conviction because God's trying to help us. After he was born, Jesus' parents took him to the temple to get him circumcised. On their way, a very just and devout man, Simeon, saw this eight-day-old baby and had this to say about him. Luke 2, 30-32. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared in the presence of all peoples, a light of revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people Israel. He's a light of revelation. As sinful people, we love the cover of our darkness. But once exposed to the light of Jesus, we want to live in that light. We're drawn to it. We're attracted to it. God wants to shine the light in our life to say, because, hey, there's a few issues, but if you'll just repent, I'll get all that cleaned up, and I'll bless your life. Even though we sometimes slip back into our old ways, our old habits, there's still the light of Jesus, still drawing us, saying, hey, come back to this side. He is.
is that spiritual light in a dark world. He is that spiritual light of life when the darkness tries to overtake us. If we'll just believe in him. Look what John says. It's in John 3, 17 through 19. It says this. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world. He's not condemning us when he shows us that we've done wrong. But to save the world through him. Verse 16. Or, or, or excuse me. Verse 18. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. But whoever does not believe stands condemned already because they have not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. Watch verse 19. This is the verdict. Light has come into the world, but people loved darkness instead of light because their deeds were evil. What am I trying to say? Man, we celebrate Christmas this time of year during the winter solstice, we're during the darkest time of, 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 in the natural, because God's trying to say, hey, I will light up your life. I'll give you direction. I'll give you purpose. When you get that bad doctor's report, I'll be there. When you have that injury, I'll be there. When you don't know what to do financially, I'll be there. When the spouse says, man, I'm ready to call quits, I'll be there. When the kids have gone crazy and lost their mind, God says, I'll be there. When the world goes nuts, I'll be there is what he is saying. He is that light. Man, praise God. So we have a choice in closing. We can choose Jesus and live eternity in heaven in his light. Or we can choose the world and live eternally in darkness separated from his light. The reality is no one chooses darkness. They rather reject the light. For those of us who accept the light, Jesus tells us we're to share that light. We're a light that, on a hill that can't be hid. Jim was leaving church. The pastor grabbed him and said, Jim, I need you in the army of the Lord. I need you here serving every Sunday. He said, I'm in the army of the Lord. The pastor said, well, how come I only see you at Christmas and Easter? Jim looked to the right and the left. He said, because I'm in the secret service. Open yourself up to the light of Jesus Christ. I've never had more purpose than when I gave my light to Christ. I've never had more zeal. I've never had more value. I've had, never had more to hope for. I've never had more in store for my life and my family than when I gave my life to Jesus. I've never been more free. I've never been more liberty. I've never been more filled with joy. I've never been happier. I've never had more peace. I've never, the list goes on and on than when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. Whew, man, can anybody testify to that? John 12, 46 says it this way. I've come as a light into the world so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. Jesus is that true light. I'd like for you to bow your heads and close your eyes for just a moment, if you will. And I want to just ask you, are you tired of being in the dark? Would you like some answers? Would you like some help? Jesus is the light of the world. He is the true light of Christmas. He is... He is offering hope to everyone, the gift of light, which is nothing less than the light of life and the eternal life. God is so good. He's done so much for us. Now, I'm not here to embarrass anybody. I'm not going to ask anybody to move or get up or anything like that. With no one looking around, you say, man, I got some, I'm doing some dark stuff. It's been a tough year, preacher. Man, it's been a tough year between COVID and losing family members or friends. Having some struggles in my marriage. Having some struggles physically, financially. Fact is, I'm not here by mistake. I need some help. Nobody else is around. They don't see the frustration I'm dealing with. They don't see the anger. They don't see the hopelessness I feel. 
Preacher, the truth is 2020 and 21 has been a long, windy, dark road. I've been living the winter solstice for a whole year. I don't see a light at the end of the tunnel, but I'd like to. I got to do something different because what, what I'm doing now ain't working for me. I need some help. If I see you, I just want to pray for you right where you sit. Would you just raise your hand? You don't have to raise it tall. I just want to, I just want to pray for you. God bless you. Is there anybody else? I'm not going to ask you to move or come. God bless you. I see that hand. Is there anybody else? I just need some help. I need some light in my life. Let me just pray. I feel like there's more, but let me just pray. Father, in Jesus' name, I pray for those individuals that raise their hand right now, God. It's been a dark time, and for those that maybe are under the sound of my voice that, that don't, that's okay. But I bless them, Father. Lord, just as we celebrate in just a few days, in six days, we celebrate your birth. I pray, Father God, as we do that and that light of the glory of the gospel of Jesus Christ shine down in our heart, I pray in Jesus' name that you bless these folks in here today. That, God, you will show a little light at the end of the tunnel. That you would give a little hope. Oh, God, that you would draw that marriage closer back together than they've even been before. That you will take what the devil's meant for evil and turn it for the good. That you will restore the finances that have been lost or stolen. That will restore that joy, restore that hope. And most of all, for anybody in here that does not call on you as Lord and Savior, that they will give their life to you, Lord Jesus Christ. May they be saved. May the light shine in their heart. May you give hope. May you bring revelation. May you guide our steps today. We celebrate you, we honor you, and we worship you now. In Jesus' name, everybody said? Amen, amen and amen. Praise God. Glory to God. If you are here today and you made that prayer to make Jesus Christ your Lord and Savior, we just first want to say welcome to the family. You know, biblically, the Bible says that we're all brothers and sisters in Christ when we believe in Jesus, and that is thicker than blood. It's thicker than anything because we're united by the Holy Spirit. So we just want to say welcome to the family, first of all. And um, the cool thing about the Lord is he does not want us to journey alone. He literally designed us to be in community one, with one another, to grow with one another. So we want to know who you are. So if you made Jesus your Lord and Savior, text um, believe to the number on the screen and someone is going to reach out to you because we want to do this together. If you're new, this is your first time, and you say, hey, this service was for me. I really liked it. There are two ways that you can get connected with us. The first is there should be little connect cards in the chair seat that is in front of you. Fill that out and drop it off at the welcome wall in the little gray boxes, or you can scan the QR code that's behind me. If you're online, we want to get to know you too. So scan the QR code in the comments box, and someone will reach out to you this week. How many of y'all know that this is the season of giving, right? Okay, so what better way to give than to give back to God? And um, so if you feel led to give today, nobody's gonna come check if you did or not, but there's three ways you can do it. The first is you can drop off money in the gray boxes near the welcome wall, or you can text to give. That information is on the screen, or you can give online at thebridgecincy.com slash give. Miss Norma, if you will come up. Come on down, Miss Norma. Miss Norma is deciding here on this Sunday to uh, become a member of the church, and we are honored to have this Sandy Randall's mom. Just stand right here. Amen. Miss Norma gave her life to Christ in the lobby, I guess about six months ago, something like that. I had the privilege of praying with her. She'd been through Purple Book, and... Uh, she said, a life transform, transformation, a great light shined in your life, didn't it? Amen. Praise God. Well, if you'll pull up the, on the overhead for me, 
Having received Christ as your Lord and Savior and being in agreement with the values and ideas presented by Bridge of Hope Church, I, I want to ask you, do you feel led by the Holy Spirit to unite with the Bridge of Hope family? And in doing so, do you commit yourself to God and the other members to do the following? Let me state what that is, and then you can give me the nod afterwards. Amen. Number one, I'll protect the unity of my church by acting in love towards other members, by refusing to gossip, by following the leaders. Number two, I will share the responsibilities of my church by praying for its growth, by inviting the unchurched to attend, and by warmly welcoming those who visit. Thirdly, I will serve the ministry of my church by discovering my gifts and talents, by being equipped and trained to serve by my pastors and leaders, and by developing a servant's heart. And then lastly, number four, I will support the testimony of my church by attending church faithfully, by living a godly life, by giving regularly. Amen. Aren't you glad, church, for Norma? Her family. We're so glad you're here. We want to welcome you. I'm going to give everyone a chance to come by and welcome her. But before we do, I want to wish you a very Merry Christmas. And to my best tune, and you'll know, know why I don't lead in worship, but we wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas. We wish you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. Thanks for coming out, everybody. Come by and give Norma a hug, and we'll see you out in the lobby. Thanks for coming out. Remember, stay connected with us throughout the week. Uh, you can do that on the Church Center app or on social media. We have Facebook and Instagram. Thanks so much. Have a